one. Welcome back, everybody, to um, Hoops HD's. Um, it's under the radar, Chad. Oh, under the wait. Hold on a second. I uh, under the radar. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, I gotta do a little Nancy Pelosi here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, under the radar. Uh, Chad, that was uh, the oh. puppet's ticket out of the puppet bunker this year. <laughs> I'm your host, Chad Sherwood. We got David Griggs. We got John Salika. Uh, this is our under the radar podcast where we focus in on the 22 non normally multi bid leagues. I guess that's the way we put it. Uh, uh, John, yeah. John, can you tell us a little bit more about what it really means to be under the radar, though? Well, first and foremost, we're talking about the 22 conferences that Chad mentioned that are outside of the Power Five conferences, along with the Big East, the American, the Atlantic 10, the West Coast Conference, and the Mountain West Conference, sponsored by Conex Expo, yes. Con AGG. Yes, the Con Expo, <laughs> Con AGG. And then the second qualifier is you cannot be a member of the top 25, so we might be excluding Northern Iowa later on in the season, but... As of right now, they are still eligible to be in this podcast. No, 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 Yale kind of creeping up there in the standings as well. I would not be surprised if they keep winning, that they don't make the top 25 as well. But uh, I don't think we've ever gone through a full season yet without one of these teams making the top 25 at some point. And there's a chance also, only a few weeks left, David. It's uh, getting, yeah. getting, getting towards the end here. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, but what we like to do in this show is focus in on a feature conference every night and then go from there through the rest of the conference in alphabetical order. And tonight I want to focus in on a conference that probably when you look at the standings, maybe one of the most exciting conferences in terms of the regular season finish in terms of what we are going to see in the conference tournament. And on top of that, a conference that legitimately, legitimately has a chance to win a game in the NCAA tournament from whoever wins the conference tournament. Um, I'm talking, of course, about a team that a conference that may put a team in the first four in Dayton and win its game there, but <laughs> so legitimately a chance to win a game. Uh, and I'm talking about the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference. Look at these standings that are coming up on the screen right now. One game in the lost conference t- separating first place from eighth place right now. That is unbelievable parody, and it's just, you know, when you're when you're going through this league and you're looking at the games and you're kind of picking out, okay, which teams to pay attention to, which games to watch, because, like, you're, you're typically not – while we watch a lot, I don't think we watch every minute of every Metro Atlantic game, and it just seems like every week it's a team that I hadn't seen before, so therefore I've seen virtually everyone in this league, and of course Iona is going to win the tournament. And if you're talking about a team like uh, Monmouth, for example, their win against a rider on Sunday was actually their first victory against one of the top five teams right here because everyone, all the other teams they've beaten in conference play so far had been in the, the bottom six of the standings. Yeah, but then they give that back, John, on Tuesday night, the only game that's happened so far since Monday, this conference, and they lose a game at Fairfield. So, uh, you know, I mean, that just even – further muddies up these standings here every time we think Monmouth or maybe Quinnipiac is about to pull away maybe Ryder's ready to pull away in this uh, league remember Siena almost pulled away once and uh, then like Iona was the preseason favorite well, well, I- Iona you know we got we you know in last place right now Tim Clouse has not been there since like in, in December when he went out with a with health yeah. problems and we do send our best to him I don't know that he's going to get back at all this season I haven't heard anything at this point yet but uh you know, I mean, obviously that has had an effect on the team 5-12 oh, yeah. overall. Um, uh, and <laughs> The other thing about this league is that it just runs the gamut. you got Monmouth that runs up and down the floor like crazy, and then you've got Fairfield that is one of the slowest teams in the country. And, and the slow beat the fast on Tuesday. Yeah, they did. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, you know, this conference, though, I, I don't know. You know, they're, they're, they are not good teams. There is – Maybe an outside chance if somebody from here on out pretty much runs the table and wins the conference tournament, they could hit the 15 line, maybe yeah. need a couple of upsets, but there's a real good chance this conference champion is going to, going to Dayton for the first four. And the ultimate not, irony is... the seed without that, yeah. I was going to say, the ultimate irony is five years ago, we had Monmouth as a team possibly pegged to go to Dayton, but that would be in the 11 or 12 playing game. But now we're talking yeah. more about... Uh, an opening playing game in the 16s. Well, this this conference has gone at large, but Ziona did it. They went yeah. to the very first first four. 
Yeah, Iona did it. Uh, Manhattan was inside the bubble. I don't remember if they got an at-large bid, but I think they did. Uh, Siena, up, up on the nine line, uh, back when Fran McCaffrey was there. So, yeah, I mean, they've gotten at-large bids, and they've gotten – they've been seated inside the bubble, but not the last couple of years. I have up here on the right side of the screen the upcoming games this week, Friday, Sunday, even one game coming up on Wednesday next week. Uh, in terms of the league standings and who's going to win this conference, the one game to pay attention to is all of them. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> all of them. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't even know where, where, to, where to start with this conference. You know, uh, I guess St. Peter's at Monmouth actually on Sunday is a big game. The other two yeah, it is. That, that are seven and four at the top of the league standings in. Uh, well, actually, St. Peter's does play at Marist on Friday. Monmouth is off on Friday. So that a, could be a big one. Actually, St. Peter's, they win those two. They're going to have a commanding league in this conference. As far, yeah, as yeah. and in St. Peter's, somebody that we really, at least coming into the season, weren't that big on. I mean, we weren't really talking about them as contending for the conference. And they have a chance to break away from the pack here a little bit, the Peacocks. Yeah. Uh, although they do have to win two road games to get there. So uh, yeah. who knows? They could also go 0-2 just as easily <laughs> this week right. for the way I've seen. Uh, Quinnipiac, a real good season as well so far pair of home games against Iona and Manhattan. So I could see them sitting there at eight and four come next week. But on the bright side for St. Peter's, at least we can talk about the Peacocks on the court as opposed to off the court, which was more of a drama back in November and December when that head coach Shaheen Holloway was <laughs> actually suspended. Yeah. I forgot all about that. Anyway, <laughs> I guess let's uh, circle on around to the rest of the conferences though, but Metro Atlantic, we haven't focused on it. We've touched on it every week and didn't focus on it much. Uh, coming to Atlantic city for the conference tournament. I hope to be there. I'm waiting to yep. hear still if I'm going to be there or not, but I uh, hope to be there. And I think it's going to be, uh, I think there there may be eight teams that can win this conference order. Maybe nine, maybe ten, maybe eleven, yeah. <laughs> maybe twelve. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but uh, let's go over to the America East uh, and start running through the conferences. Where uh, Vermont, we talked about for the past few weeks here, but this Vermont team is really starting to look good at this point. Nice yeah. win at Albany. Uh, not a, a revenge game per se, but they actually struggled up in Maine. They took care of Maine at home easily tonight, though. Yeah, I can't believe they struggled the last time they were in Maine, and I can't believe like. Rocco, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight, actually said, watch this game. This is going to be good. I was wondering what he was drinking because I wanted some. But it was <laughs> a good game. It, it, the first one, not tonight. But uh, Stony Brook, l let's not overlook them either. Kind of keeping pace there. Uh, again, two big wins this past week. Well, sort of against, uh, you know, sort of the middle of the conference anyway. But, uh, you, you know, they're only one game behind Vermont. They are. We so also have some clear separation, though, at least between the top four teams, because Albany and Hartford are also yeah. looking like teams that'll definitely be on pace to host at least a one conference tournament game. Yeah. Right. And I know we got a lot to get to, but one of the reasons I love this league, and you, you look at the up, upcoming games here, uh, the storylines, uh, Hartford competing, if they can get up to the th to second place and they're just one game behind it. Uh, they can host a semifinal game. Uh, this conference, they do it right. It's set up the conference tournaments at campus sites all the way throughout. So a lot at stake in a league where, you know, four games are separated by just – four teams, excuse me, separated by just two games. Yeah, and that makes this a huge week for Hartford, hosting Vermont, a huge task there. Uh, then a real interesting game against – Albany on Wednesday night, which could be for a chance to at least be the team that's going to be battling Stony Brook the rest of the season for that two seed and the shot to not only host a quarterfinal, but maybe that's host it. a semifinal as well. Yeah. Uh, all in all, I think, you know, it's all going to be about who goes to Vermont for the championship game and loses there, but that's another story. Yeah. Uh, Atlantic Sun time, Liberty, real bad week last week, came back this past week uh, to pair of home wins easily over Kennesaw and Gulf Coast. Uh, but still no. technically tied with North Florida in the standings who they lost to. So uh, North right. Florida, I guess, by the tiebreakers is the one seed right now. Uh, they are. Uh, now they play again at Liberty. Uh, at that point, if it uh, – uh, this conference does tiebreakers differently. I, I, I remember, or at least they used to, because the year Mercer and Gulf Coast tied, uh, Gulf Coast somehow won the tiebreaker. Yeah, it, but also it, keep in mind another reason we're talking about North Florida actually being number one at the moment is because they actually beat Stetson last Thursday, so at least they could stay in a tie for first with a Liberty and knock Stetson down to third for the time being. And, and yeah. a couple other quick notes on this conference. Um, 
first of all, North Alabama, who you see in red there, will, despite the fact they're ineligible, still transitional, they will be allowed to participate in the conference tournament. Should they win the conference tournament, whoever the regular season champion is, whoever the one seed is, will get the automatic bid. So keep an eye on that. We ended up with a situation a few years ago with Stetson, if you remember, playing in the conference championship game and play, I believe playing for North Florida, if I recall. Yeah, yeah, uh, they were. They lost the game, but uh, had they won North Florida, who got the automatic bid, they lost to Florida Gulf Coast, who got the auto bid that year. Yeah, um, I, I, that's a little odd to me. I, I, I don't mind them not playing in it, but it seems like if you're going to eliminate a team that is eligible to go to the NCAA tournament, why not just eliminate North well, Alabama? I, I mean, the team we're going to be eliminating is Kennesaw, David, and this team is a Centenary Award candidate. They're one of the worst teams in D1, so I'm not uh, totally yeah. – well, But we on got... the bright <laughs> side for uh, Kennesaw, they at least get to play for the Canacomb on Saturday, so – Lose that, that one, and yes, they pretty much are done. <laughs> yeah. Can it go up on Saturday? <laughs> oh my god! Did <laughs> I mention they're only eight miles apart and have never played in the NCAA tournament? <laughs> Let's take a look at the Kennecombe Cup. We've got our Hoops HD rivalry checker that we broke out during our – what was it? During our Hoops HD report, we could check any two teams in the NCAA and find out certain information about them if they are a rival. Kennesaw State, Lipscomb, the Kennecombe Cup. Yes, John, you were right. They are only eight miles apart if they were been in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Oh, this podcast has gone bad already. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> Okay, I, I was actually going to make a point about Kennesaw State. It's being, gone, David. Let's move on. Being three games back with seven, with only seven to play, so they are potentially two weeks away from being a limit. Who cares? Let's move on. <laughs> the big Sky Conference, John. We have a new first place team with Eastern Washington now. Uh, off of Montana's lost to Portland State uh, this past week. Uh, now, Eastern Washington, sole position of first place, pair of road wins at Sac State at Northern Arizona. Yeah, that's against a Northern Arizona team that surprisingly is still in the uh, top half of the standings in uh, Sacramento State. While they did get off to their best D1 start, they've tailed back to what seems to be their customary. Wait, wait, wait. To tailed back, this Sacramento State team didn't even bother showing up Monday night at home against a pathetically bad Idaho team. Uh, Quite honestly, I'm, I don't know the Sac State wins another game this season, despite their great start to the year. That, I think the team that. has nailed it in. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I, no insult to Sac State. I, it's a team that I've rooted for for years, but I, I've given up on them for this season. But go ahead, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but I think another team we also have to keep an eye on, at least as far as a top two seed and getting to wear white in a neutral court, would be Northern Colorado. Uh, so that means that we could have a championship, an, an Okoye Wu championship game here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it again! <laughs> doing it again! The Okoye Wu championship! <laughs> uh, talking about the upcoming week, I actually have a big game coming here Thursday night. Eastern Washington's at Montana. Dave, this is yeah. one of the few times I'm really, really circling a game for the uh, in the big sky this season. This game Thursday night's a huge one. Yeah, especially with I, – I, you alluded to this, but how well Eastern Washington's been playing. And, I, you know, they, they went through that one stretch where, it, you know, they, they struggled, and I think we sort of started looking over them. But, you know, now you look, they've strung together a lot of wins, played their way in the first place. If they win at Montana, like if they go on the road and beat them, they'll be two games ahead of them, and they'll have a clear shot at finishing in first. Yeah, yeah. Um... But let's take a look. Let's move on here. Uh, David, Big South Conference, a conference that normally has standings like we saw at the top of the show in the Metro Atlantic, but not this year where Winthrop is now 10-0. And I, I've been yeah. a long time since we've seen a team undefeated this late in the season in the Big South. Yeah, 10-0 and and with the big game at Radford already behind them. And I think they've, they've played at, at Hampton as well. So uh, they've got a clear shot at – it finishing first, which means hosting the conference tournament. Uh, you, you know, two road wins this week, wasn't it? Yeah, at, at Asheville and at Charleston. Well, home against Asheville, but yeah. oh, it was at home again. Yeah, it was home against Asheville. I'm sorry. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, n nice win at Charleston Southern, who's had a, a solid season so far. Uh, yeah, uh, they're hosting Campbell this week. Then on uh, yeah, Saturday, the camp they're, drop. 
They're they going to, the, but but the big game, John, on Saturday, they're going to Longwood. Can you tell the us about Winwood it? Winwood Classic. <laughs> yes, yeah, so let's take a little bit more look at the Winwood Classic here. This is Winthrop and Longwood, one of our favorite rivalries. <laughs> the Winwood Cup. <laughs> one of our favorite Big South rivalries. These are here. these are actual trophy games. We're not yeah. just making this. Yes, up. And, and just for those interested, these two teams are eight miles apart. Miles and they have apart. never no, met. Eight miles level. apart. I didn't realize they were that close. <laughs> I never met the NCAA. Oh, I mean, it's you, you. Have you noticed like all these rivalries that have all have that in common? Well, well, you got to be close to each other to be a big rivalry, don't you? Yeah. Uh, it, but after the Winwood Cup on Saturday, a Monday night here, there's a Monday schedule in the Big South. Uh, I think that's uh, actually February 10th. That's just a random Monday schedule in the Big South. It's not even a holiday, but uh, Radford Winthrop, the return game at Winthrop coming up Monday night. So another one just yeah. in this conference. W- which would put them three games ahead with, it, do they play a 20 game or 18 game I, I, since they added? Um, I believe it's uh, 18 games. Okay. So, I, I mean, if they win all three of those, you're, you're talking a three game lead with five left. They're very close to, to locking it down if Winthrop keeps going. I'm and, trying to confirm that it, it is an 18 game season. Yes, that, that is absolutely confirmed. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, John. Let's jump over to the Big West Conference, a conference that uh, is oh, uh, lots of lots of cup games in this one. Lots of trophies. Uh, I, I don't even want to talk about the Rivervine Cup or anything like that. Although maybe we have to soon. Uh, but Hawaii and Irvine, John, at the top of the standings here, and looking to take a looking to be a step above everybody else. Yeah, Hawaii was a team that they had just the. Uh, the one game late on a Saturday night against a Northridge. So not surprising they would come out with a victory there. And Irvine also winning the uh, divine matchup at uh, UC Davis, along with <laughs> another win against Fullerton. So the usual suspects are in play. And We're doing it again. Uh, I think the disappointing team of this conference though, has been UC Santa Barbara. They, uh, you know, I really thought that this team, Santa Barbara team would contend for the conference title. They lost the game at Northridge on Thursday night. Did bounce back with a win at the beach, but still three and four in conference are really not in contention at this point for the conference regular season title. Yeah, totally agree with that because even throughout out of conference play, they were, you know, they entered conference play at, at 11 and four and you kind of expected them to do a lot better than what they've done. Uh, Irvine, not anything like what they were a year ago. L- let me see this about Hawaii. I, I keep waiting for them to you know, fall behind because I just figure it's so hard for them to play on the road. But so far, you know, holding really strong. Yeah, three games actually coming up in the next seven days here for Hawaii. At Santa Barbara, at Cal Poly, the next Wednesday hosting the beach. Mm -hmm. Uh, Irvine on the hand is hosting Davis. And uh, coming up next Wednesday, the River Vine Cup. Yes, the River Vine Cup. (laughs) Uh, Actually, we mentioned this last week, UC Riverside, probably the best seat. I think this is their best season since they moved up to D1 and uh, right in there at oh, least yeah. for a three seed in the conference tournament, which yeah, you know, this oh, is a team man. that has, misses the conference tournament many seasons. So Yeah, how much fun would it be to see them win? The, I, I don't think they got it in them, but uh, to see them win the conference tournament. Uh, John, the Colonial Athletic Association, uh, we now have a three-way tie, and I think this is going to be a fun conference the rest of the way. Hofstra, William & Mary, and Charleston all right there. Towson even only just came back. But I would say Hofstra, far and away, is going to be the big winner thanks to their win at William and Mary, and also yes. a win at Elon to at least give themselves some prime positioning as far as uh, tiebreakers go. William and Mary just can't seem to be able to separate themselves even after they get a a clutch win against uh, Northeastern, who's kind of middling in the standings, but we still had high hopes for preseason. And Charleston also taking care of their business with a. Uh, a road sweep at uh, James Madison and Towson. Yeah, this is a conference that I definitely am going to be keeping my eye on the rest of the way. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, we're not playing technically for any type of uh, – And it's also not field, an insignificant win against uh, Towson either because otherwise you would have had the Tigers in a three-way tie with uh, Hofstra and Bill and Mary. Yeah, and yep. an in- interesting week ahead, the big game Thursday night, William Mary at College of Charleston, the winner of that game – Actually, we'll take a half game lead in the conference standings with Hofstra off on Thursday. Uh, Hofstra then hosting Northeastern on Saturday. Yeah, Northeastern, you know, kind of an inconsistent team. 
but their ceiling is pretty high and, and they're good enough to break some stuff in the conference tournament. I mean, if you're a seven seed, you're not really relaxing in that quarterfinal game. Agreed. Um, David, Conference USA, we have about a week and a half. I think there's four games left before we get past the uh, initial stage of play here and we get into what they call the bonus play. We can discuss, we'll discuss that a lot more next week where we get to yeah. the end of the first 14 games and we go into the final four games that are not quite scheduled yet. But at the moment, we've got a tie between Louisiana Tech and North Texas with Western Kentucky just a game back. Yeah, North Texas really getting hot in uh, conference play until they went to, until they played Rice on Saturday. Yeah, and, and got clobbered. But, uh, <laughs> That's two and eight Rice, who was one and eight going into the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that could have gone better. Western <laughs> Kentucky, I, I just don't think they've got it. I, I I know that they're the most talented team. I, I know that if anybody can really step up on, up on a team on the round of sixty four, it's probably them. The problem is they don't play up to that level as often as they should. And I just don't think they're going, I, they're going to underachieve the rest of the way. And I think Louisiana tech's ultimately going to be the team that wins it. I, agree um, I think I the other surprise this week is actually going to be FIU. Yes, they did get a nice win at home against a Western Kentucky, but before that they actually stumbled at home against Marshall. So the Panthers. I, 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 I'd say more than that, John, even Florida Atlantic, the other Florida team who also beat Western Kentucky this week, followed it up with that with a win over Marshall. Uh, they're right on the doorstep. They're battling Charlotte and Florida International for the for the making that top five and being in the top pod when you go into the bonus play here. Yeah, Florida International clobbering FAU tonight. And I mean, for those that don't know what the heck I'm talking about here, uh, after the first 14 games of the regular season in Conference USA, they create three pods: the top five teams, the next five teams, the bottom four teams, who then all play each other for their final four games of the regular season, uh, so that you are. It's kind of a strategy here, I guess, that you play the best teams at the end of the season or play yeah. these, your own caliber teams at the end of the season. It's, like to, it's, to, it's to help tweak the matrix in their favor. Yeah, it didn't work. I mean, they're not it, getting it at large bid, right. so it doesn't really yeah. matter. <laughs> but uh, upcoming this week in CUSA, we've got Louisiana Tech at Western Kentucky, a big game Thursday night. We've also got uh, – so, um, who else does Louisiana Tech play? At Marshall then on Saturday. That's their other game. Yeah, so a big week for La Tech. If they get through both of those, I mean, they're they're really running downhill. All right. Uh, John, the Horizon League, this is kind of in your backyard being our Ohio guy here on the panel. Uh, and Wright State is in first place, although no longer the commanding lead that they had thanks to a trip to Green Bay that didn't go very well. Yeah, one of the other side effects is now both uh, Wright State and NKU have a loss to uh, Green Bay. So assuming both teams were to win out in the way things are shaping up right now, NKU would actually own the tiebreaker for the time being because they've, they would have a sweep against Illinois and Chicago, whereas uh, Wright State would have a split right here. But if the wild card is if Detroit manages to get ahead of UIC in the standings, then Wright State would own the tiebreaker by virtue of a potential sweep against the Titans right here. So that's a race we're going to have to watch, assuming there are no further shenanigans in the conference. Yeah, I mean, it's going to take a lot for them to be tied here. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. with still a lot of yeah. time to go. Though, and and with no home saying. court advantage, you wonder, the top two teams buy into the semis anyway. Well, there, there are home courts for the first two rounds, but the top two teams bypass those first two rounds. So, yeah. It pretty much doesn't matter. Uh, but it would take a collapse by either Wright State or Northern Kentucky to actually have to go on to the bottom rungs of that ladder. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and those two teams are both Wright State and NKU at home this week, hosting Detroit and Oakland, uh, both of them. Mm -hmm. um, in the Ivy League, David, uh, one of those teams that may have a shot to crack the top 25, you see them at 31 in the coaches poll there. These the Yale team is, uh, you know, started off conference play now 4-0, and tied with Princeton. Uh, but I'm a believer in this Yale team. They, they cruise past Cordell and Columbia at home this week. Yeah, no problems this week. It gets a little bit harder as it goes along, but uh, the, well, the big game was was the big week was actually out of Princeton, who I did not really believe in, but beat Harvard at home. 
you know, beat them pretty bad. Real disappointing week for Harvard. I, I yeah. kind of wanted to get on that because Harvard was clearly the team coming into the season, not so much conference play, but the season that we thought would make noise and, and maybe get into the get inside the bubble and not have to win the conference tournament. Getting off to a, a, an unimpressive start, but they appeared to have it together but not this week, and so not this week. Yeah, in fact, the in fact there's nothing left this week. There we go. Yeah. Let's try that again. Uh, but I'm trying to get get the next week's schedule up here in the Ivy. There it is. Uh, big game Friday night. Harvard at Yale. Um, yeah, that's always a fun one. But um, you, you know, Yale just looks the part. I, I, you know, I really. I think Yale has what it takes to go 14 and 0. Yeah, and another game coming up here Friday night, Stalika. Let's go back to our rivalry checker. We have Dartmouth and Brown make meeting each other. Can you tell us a little about this Dartmouth and Brown rivalry? The Brown, uh, this, yep, or the Mouse Brown, depending on your uh, point of view. But at the end of the day, they are only eight miles apart and have never met in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> yes, so yes, that is the Brown Mouth Cup, and we have yeah. lost it again. So <laughs> we apologize. <laughs> oh. The Brown oh, Mouth for nothing. Cup, when, when that was instituted, I lost it. Uh, I forget how many years ago. <laughs> Let's go to the American the Cup. Brown Mouth uh, this Trophy is a broken chair. We ship it to the winner. A rough week in the, in the Mid-American Conference, actually, where, first of all, Akron loses the wagon wheel rivalry Friday night to Kent State. We've been following them. Then Bowling Green who now we were all high on, loses to Central Michigan on the road on Tuesday night. Kind of bad, uh, too. And, and, I mean, and so, it's you say, maybe Central Michigan, out of the West, they are selling the best team in the conference, and we haven't even discussed them much this year. We've been focusing I mean, it so much on the a completely, It wasn't a completely bad weekend for Bowling Green, because they were also coming off of a clutch win at Buffalo that at least kept them on top of the Eastern Division for now. And even I, with the loss at Central Michigan, they're still – a game clear of the league lead for now. Yeah, I was surprised by that game. I, I really expected Bowling Green to go in there and win it. And Central Michigan basically had them at arm's length the entire way. I don't want to say they blew them out, but at no point in that game did it look like Bowling Green was, you know, threatening to actually win it. Now, the standings are a little bit off here. Um, not off in terms of this is what they actually are, but – uh, Central Michigan only eight games with Bowling Green, for example, has 10 games. games. Uh, Central Michigan had their game at Miami, Ohio postponed last week. Uh, they'll be coming up again in a couple of weeks here due to a, uh, a scare, ridiculous a, like, a coronavirus scare that proved to be. Uh, we, we got into that last week. We'll go back yeah. into it. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, maybe Central Michigan is a team that we haven't discussed that we need to discuss a little bit more in this conference as we move forward. Uh, and coming up this week, they are at Buffalo and hosting Eastern Michigan so that, you know, if they win at Buffalo, I'm going to really be taking this team seriously. Yeah, I mean, you should. Uh, Akron is hosting Eastern Michigan. Bowling Green is hosting Toledo and then at Akron. So that's another game to circle Tuesday night, Bowling Green at Akron. Mm -hmm. um, John, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, one of your favorite leagues. I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, this is going to be another instance where Norfolk State, they only get one shot at NC a &T and NC Central and actually ended up coming short in both games. So they may end up as a number three seed overall, depending on how NC a &T and NC Central do. But by the same token, no other terrible surprises that were coming out on the court this week. Although I think Chad had a story about a Bethune Cookman off the court, unfortunately. Actually, David, that's your story. Why don't you do? not you talk a little bit Bethune? Yeah, uh, really. Bethune Cookman announced, I believe it was today. It may have been yesterday uh, that they had. It has basically been recommended to them by their uh, accrediting body that they need to account for an eight million dollar debt, either have it paid down or have subs. You know have it demonstrated as to how they're going to pay it down to the satisfaction of the accrediting agency, or they will lose their accreditation. If that happens, the school will likely close. Uh, they have a few months to get it together. This is the second time in, I think, four or five years where it looked like a MEAC school might not just lose its basketball team and its athletic programs, but have the school close for good. I, I personally hate to see that. I mean, I think HBCUs are important. They've been historically important. I think that they serve typically a demographic of society, especially low socioeconomic areas and people that come from those. 
that uh, that a lot of the other campuses don't in a way that they don't. And you, you kind of hate to see, yeah, I mean, they're, because they service that demographic, they don't have a lot of money. And you kind of hate to see them in financial trouble and with the threat of closing. Uh, it's just, my God, I mean, here they are going to be in the MEAC tournament in March, and are, are we going to be wondering if this is going to be it for good for them? Well, they they are talking, apparently, according to what I read, they are to be talking with the MEAC about maybe cutting sub-sports out. Um, I doubt it would be basketball or football. Those are the big ones, but, you know, you may see some sports cutter. But from what I'm hearing, what I've read so far, looks like they're hopeful that they will get through this, and, and I really hope they do because yeah. it would be a real shame to see that happen to a to a division one school nonetheless yeah or, or to anybody i mean you don't want to see anybody I'm pretty see sure that. it would not be basketball because i think it's required that every athletic department at least uh, sponsor this sport right here oh, yeah. they wouldn't uh, cut basketball like bas. i mean they would basketball makes too much money uh north carolina a t this week in terms of games uh they're the first place team they are at bethune cook we just discussed and then at florida a and m a and m team that beat Iowa State. So big week for a &T. They go 2-0 this week. Uh, they can be the team that we are really talking about starting to take control of this conference uh, versus a team like Norfolk State, who we discussed for the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Missouri Valley Conference time. Uh, one more score that's not on the screen yet. A couple more scores that went final since we started the show, but Northern Iowa did win tonight at Valpo. That makes them actually 9-2 and two and uh, starting to pull away from this conference a little bit here. Uh, Southern yeah. Illinois is right on their heels, though. Did pick up the win at Evansville tonight. Yeah, Evansville. And I think, that is that six in a row for Southern Illinois? Yes, I mean, they've I so. really, really been playing well these past few weeks. But, I, I, you know, they've been playing well from a conference standpoint. Northern Iowa is still looking good by a, a national standpoint, as you see there, a top 40 in the net. Um, uh, um, border, that's the other team that's close to making the top 25 if, if one of these teams is going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, again, if, if they can win out, which they certainly can, uh, they, I think they'll be inside the bubble. I've said it before, and I'll also say it again. Keep an eye on the trees because they not only win at Missouri State, they also beat Loyal with Chicago to actually end up in a third-place tie right here. And the other fun fact about Indiana State, only school to lose by single digits at Dayton this year. Northern Iowa, this upcoming week, a big rivalry game. It is a home game, but it is their in-state rival against Drake on Saturday, uh, followed by a home game against Illinois State on Wednesday. They lost at Illinois State earlier this year. So uh, two big home games for, for you and I this week, actually. Yeah. Um, John, the Northeast Conference is coming up here. And, I mean, look at the first place team. This is a team that I really think could be dangerous in the first four. Uh, wait a second. They're in red. <laughs> I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop as far as uh, Mary Mack. And I will have a final thought similar to this later on. But if you look at the week they had, they're pretty much taking care of business against uh, both St. Francis, Brooklyn and uh, Long Island right here. While Robert Morris is also holding serve with wins against uh, Brian and central Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah, David, when you look, if you throw Mary Mack out of the standings here, though, I mean, Robert Morris, I still think this is probably going to end up being the team to beat. Uh, I know Sacred Heart and SFPA are kind of there, but uh, it just seems Bobby Hill always wins this conference. Yeah, and they, they've really been playing well this year, so I, I, I kind of go along. I, I kind of go along with that as far as finishing first, which would mean, what would that mean, Chad? Hosting, uh, hosting the conference tournament. Yeah, all throughout. Uh, a uh, few games to note coming up this week. Robert Morris actually at Wagner, then at Sacred a Heart, a big one. game on Saturday. Merrimack yeah. got fairly Dickinson in that Long Island. So uh, two tough road tests for the first place team, uh, yeah. even if they are not eligible for recent. Yeah, they, and they CIT, play. are you watching College Insider? Invite Merrimack. Absolutely. Invite Merrimack. Give them home court throughout the tournament. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's pretty much a fait accompli right now, assuming the NCAA doesn't do a, a last-second waiver here. No. Other than the, the Ivy League, we still have one other conference with two undefeated teams in it in all of D1, and that is this Murray State-Austin P battle going on in the Ohio Valley, but that may not last past this week. They, they, they did survive. Murray State actually struggled with Eastern Illinois, but pulled it out. 
Yeah, uh, Eastern Austin. Illinois not that good, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I, that was and, uh-huh. and and actually Eastern Illinois gave, gave Austin P a game as also as well on the road. Uh, so yeah. both teams had struggled, but they are travel partners, so they will always have the same opponents. But I want to take a look at actually the upcoming schedule for both these teams this week because they both have to go to Belmont, who was preseason at least predicted to be one of the top teams in the conference. So real yeah. interesting week ahead for both Murray and Austin P. Their other game this week is at Tennessee State, who has been very competitive in league play as well. And yeah, Belmont what, themselves actually survived a, a landmine at uh, Jack State right here last week. Yeah, go ahead, David. I was going to say, like, yeah, the Nashville trip, probably at least this year, the hardest trip in conference, other than, well, uh, other than Austin P. Murray State. Uh, right. that, that one's pretty rough. But, um, yeah, I – we, we've been talking about Murray State. I, I know that, like, uh, you know, they were in the round of 32 a year ago, and I, I think that they're probably the bigger brand name. But I've actually been a little more impressed with Austin P. And um, if you're asking me to pick which one's going to make it through this and actually finish first, I think it's them. Uh, they do have a two-game lead over Eastern Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky, kind of a surprise, did nothing out of conference. One just one did one game. Has been real competitive in conference I think that they're they will eventually kind of fall back you know but I I don't see them finishing ahead of Elmont even though that they're ahead of them now um but it it's still been fun but uh Murray and Austin I think will be the two teams at the top of the ladder and buying into the semis yeah uh, obviously if they could both go 2-0 this week I think next week they'd be poised for their first of two matchups I think they then meet again I think the very last game of the regular last game season. yeah, yeah. I, I believe – is that right, Stalika? I think everybody closes against their travel partner, I think. Stalika's already – I cannot confirm, seen. but that is something I can look up. Uh, Colgate got through the week 2-0 with a win at Holy Cross and, and a big win actually at Lehigh this week. So they are still the conference leaders in the Patriot League, although the standings have, are getting a lot closer now. Only a game over BU, uh-huh. two games back to the Lafayette and American tie, even Navy and – and army kind of hanging in there, but uh, you know, we thought that Colgate was going to run through this conference. They still might at the end of the day, but had have, have had a few stumbles. In the past yeah, they have. And in, in a couple of those wins, they really had to come from behind to get them. Um, I still think that they're the best team. They certainly have probably the best overall win that win at Cincinnati. And I do think that they'll ultimately finish first, but they're not invincible, not even at all. But I do also have to give uh, BU credit for beating an Army team that actually had won a school record six in a row, at least in terms of uh, Patriot League games here. Right. Yeah. And CBS Sports Network has been doing all season a Patriot League game of the week on Monday nights. Huge one. Great choice by them coming up here Monday night. Colgate at BU. Uh, and- BU wins that game and, and they move into first place in the conference. Yeah, and that is a big one because, again, this is a conference that does it right. And – if they win, they're pushing for first place. If they lose, they're in a three-way tie. Uh, you, you took it down, but like they're they're in a three-way tie for second, and the second place you get to host a semifinal game, third and fourth place. I think the ironic thing, as far as real BU fans go, this happened to be the wrong night for such a matchup because this oh. is also going to be the same night they have the Bean Pot Championship downtown against Northeastern. Right, and, and they're probably going to be, they're gonna be up on the... chat. I don't. Oh, whoa! It is. It is a rivalry. We I want to check out Colgate BU. They're yeah, only eight miles apart. Yeah, I've never been the assembly yeah. tournament. Look at that, David. Wow! I, I did not realize that was a rivalry. That is a huge rivalry there, Colgate yeah. and BU. Uh, so, uh, probably played in the roof. They've played all the games at the roof lately. Oh, the roof. Oh, it's the best venue ever. Uh, the roof. God, the SOCON is, uh, you know, this is a, another conference we've been playing a lot of attention to. We've got three teams in the top 100, the net, including an East Tennessee state team that there's an argument. Should they went out to the conference tournament championship game? They are still on the NCAA tournament bubble for that large bid. It's, Going to be a stretch, but they did uh, – they struggled a little bit at Chattanooga tonight, but they did blow it away at the end of the game there. They did have a win, and I'm also starting to think that that Mercer game was probably just one of those aberrations because while the Bears did beat Citadel on Saturday, they did uh, end up losing rather decisively on the road at Furman, who was not overlooking them by any stretch of the imagination. And obviously UNC Greensboro – there's still going to be a game behind both Furman and East Tennessee State, but at least they 
took care of their business against Citadel tonight. Yeah, uh, just a quick score update. It's not on the screen there. Wofford also tied with Greensboro at eight and three. They did pick up the win over VMI tonight. Uh, not on the screen yet, though. Um, David, the week ahead in the SoCon here, again, we're looking at, at you know, can East Tennessee State get the revenge game at Mercer on Saturday? Can they beat be Citadel at home on Wednesday? They should be able to. Yeah. Uh, Furman's at Western Carolina and Samford, while Greensboro will be hosting uh, Samford and hosting Western Carolina. All these teams should go 2-0 this week, though. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, again, this is just sort of an exercise in not screwing yourself over. <laughs> Uh, Southland Conference, another score that did not make the screen here, but Stephen F. Austin actually 11-1 and one now. They did hold on, uh, to like struggling Nichols. to beat uh, Nichols State, who had been tied for second place, now drops to 8-4 and four in conference after that loss today. So, a uh, big win for Stephen F. Austin, actually. Yeah, it is, and we, we keep saying that this is a team that's going to be on the bubble or looked at if they win out. They do have that big win against Duke. Uh, you, you can't help but notice uh, a couple things, though. Is this the best team in the Southland? I think it absolutely is. I don't even think it's debatable. Is this a tournament-caliber team? And Chad's pulling them up here. Look at some of these metrics. 87 in the net. I, I know that it's not really emphasized anymore. Not a top 100 RPI team. Uh, not the best strength of schedule you've ever seen. Um, a lot 329 of, is <laughs> definitely not the best I've ever seen. But on the fact, I know it's one of the worst I've ever seen, David. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And, and, again, the net factors in. It, it is both predictive and uh, merit-based. So the merit probably uh, – the win against Duke is there. But when you're not blowing out, quad four teams, which, you know, going down here, 10 points, eight points, 10 points, eight points, you, you know, seven, one point, seven point. It, it's actually dragging the net down. I, I, I got, I got to tell you, even going to be on the bubble, even if they went out, I got to tell you, David, I've, we've been doing these, these podcasts for a long time. The more I look at the Stephen F. Austin profile, I honestly don't know that I've ever seen this many quad four wins by any team ever. Yeah. This, this is the, this may be the greatest quad four team <laughs> in the history of at least the quadrant system here. Look at all those sub two hundred victories. I'm impressed. Yeah. I Which mean, is that pretty is... impressive, even considering their non conference strength of schedule, yeah. aka the intent to schedule is a, a respectable one hundred and two. That's, that's not very also... respect. That, not it's not respectable by yeah. South but but, but Chad script. is right. Look at all those quad four wins. Like, who's the best team? Baylor. Let, let let's just compare them to Baylor. Uh, I'll put Baylor up here on no, the other side. No, we should side, keep yeah. comparing them to Mother Miami. <laughs> well, I, I mean, Baylor, you, you know, a one seed, a top-ranked team. And look at it. It'll come up here in a second. It's a little Nowhere bit of quad four. near the number of quad four wins. I got to say, they have more quad four wins than Baylor maybe has one and two combined. So, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, and here, David, here's a little fact about Baylor and Stephen Foster. They're both from the same state. and Yeah. Uh, Oh, I don't, it's not, I don't here. think it's a rivalry. Uh, well, let's check it. Oh, eight miles apart. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> it is a rivalry. They, they might be meeting in the NCAA tournament on 116. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's jump over to the uh, the upcoming schedule, first of all. I mentioned that uh, actually Sam Houston State, who's tied for second place, uh, is actually in a battle right now at Incarnate Ward as we record oh this in God. overtime. Yeah, they are. I didn't uh, even uh, I, I don't over. know. <laughs> oh, Lord, that is uh, just SFA, no, though, They were looking ahead to Nichols on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, SFA is hosting New Orleans on Saturday and then at Corpus Christi Revenge game on Wednesday for that big upset loss they had. So, uh, yeah. you know, but let's uh, – John, how about the Southwestern Athletic Conference? Again, this was another conference where uh, Prairie View was actually a game behind Texas Southern last week, but – Thanks to Alabama State getting a win against the Tigers on Monday, the Tigers of Texas Southern now tied with the Panthers of well, Prairie View. Who well, they were they're only tied because Alabama State beat Prairie View also. So Alabama State, although it was 2-0 at home, it was the top two teams at home. It's an Alabama State team that I understand is they were missing at least their top player for most of the season. He is back and healthy now at uh, Maybe you know, they're down in seventh place right now. We've got to keep an eye on this uh, <laughs> team here way, way down there. Right, uh, way down. Uh, but it makes things interesting with Prairie View, Texas Southern, 7-2, Alcorn State and Southern, 6-3. Six, six and three. We could have an interesting battle down the way here. Um, 
And the first round, the quarterfinals are on campus sites, at least uh, before they go to Birmingham for the semis of the championship year. Yeah. So you want to be at least a top four team so you can at least get that one home game. Um, upcoming week, big game Saturday, Texas Southern at Prairie View. Yeah, that is a big one. And uh, the first place on the line there and perhaps – a, being locked into the NIT would, would be something too. So you're guaranteed at least one of the two postseason tournaments. Uh, David, over in the Summit League, um, uh, kind of a conference, I'm kind of a little disappointed this year after what we've seen from him in prior years, although you yeah. don't have guys like Mike Dahlman in this league anymore. But uh, South Dakota State half game leave over, over North Dakota State as we record this right now. Actually, North yeah. Dakota State did win at Omaha tonight. Yeah, real so – Change yeah, that they are tied in two. Yeah, a real nice win for them tonight on the road at Omaha. Uh, Omaha had been playing really well. I think I talked last week about, like, how impressed I was or surprised I was with all the rebuilding they had to do working their way up. But a uh, real nice win for North Dakota State to go there and get it and kind of a decisive win. Yeah, it was. And uh, beyond them with three losses, actually South Dakota, they're the only team that's really in this now. And I'm trying to get the, score, the standings updated here. But uh, – John, your thoughts on the Summit League while we try to get the screen back. I mean, yes, we do have a nice little FCS rival, traditional rivalry between uh, South Dakota State and North Dakota State. Yep. But even on the basketball floor, they're usually trading automatic bids with uh, Omaha and knocking on the door in recent years, but still unable to kick that door down. And losing at home to Omaha had to be a little bit of a gut punch right here. Yeah, and, and those got updated standings, by the way. So we, we are right to the minute job. now. Live updates on the air. But, yeah, three of the four Dakotas right at the top of the league. It's it, This is kind of a fun league. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting down the road here between these between the three these three out of the four Dakota teams, North Dakota not so much. Yeah. Um, in terms of the week ahead, uh, North Dakota State is hosting Oral Roberts. South Dakota State is hosting Omaha. Uh, South Dakota hosting Western a, Illinois yeah. at North Dakota. I, you know, South da da Dakota versus Dakota versus uh, – da <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that Omaha at South Dakota State game, I mean, <laughs> if Omaha wants any, like, hope at all of staying within reach, they have to win that win. If not, it's a three-way race the rest of the way. Uh, we'll also keep going. We've got Oral Roberts here. They are – their game right now is they are playing, I guess, as we record this here. I'm trying to get a score update. Oh, that's, that's actually tomorrow night. They're at North Dakota. That's, that's why I don't have a score update. Uh, then at North Dakota State Saturday, then hosting Omaha Wednesday. So uh, they go 3-0. They're in the thick of these things. Out of, out of yeah, there's, it's, there's a very good chance they will not do that. <laughs> Sunbelt Conference. Uh, I'm done giving up on Little Rock. I'm on, I'm on the you Little know, Rock bandwagon here. All yeah, in. Yeah, I mean – Little Rock does fantastically well whenever I give up on them. I'm not giving up on them now. They got the two-game lead. Uh, Georgia State does awful when I don't give up on them. They've lost a couple – they've dropped a couple They, they lost at home to Troy this week, which is yeah, a bad, not bad loss. Bad, very bad. I'm, I'm amazed like, – like, uh, love Scott Cross. I think – and I don't mean this as a backhanded compliment, Chad. The fact that he's won 71 games this year with that, I think he's doing a good job, but give the, give him two more years. Troy will be at the top of the league. I agree with you. Uh, I'm, yeah. th this Troy team, like you said, not this year, a couple years. Oh, who knows? I mean, th yeah. they, they could win the conference tournament. <laughs> yeah. Even though it is a ladder format, you got to make the top 10 to even qualify for it. But uh, yeah, who knows? Um, but if you're also talking about one of the more bizarre stories, Arkansas State, I believe they're the only school that's actually won at Tulsa this year. Unfortunately, they got swept by, I think it was both uh, App State and uh, Coastal Carolina during the past week. Yeah, Arkansas State has just fallen off the face of the earth. Well, they'll have a chance to get back at it. A Little Rock's only this game, game this week because it'll be hosting Arkansas State on Saturday, so keep an eye yeah. on that. Georgia State, on the other hand, has the Louisiana road trip. Bottom two teams of the conference, but the way they played against Troy, who knows? Yeah, they, they may be in trouble. Yeah, right. uh, last conference of the night is the Western Athletic Conference where New Mexico State – Continues to roll 8 0 now with a. Uh, actually, they struggled, but they got the win over Bakersfield, and then they blew out Grand Canyon this week. Yeah, uh, a little surprising that they would struggle against Bakersfield, but I think they struggled against them last year, too. Um, uh, tomorrow, they, I think they go to Chicago State. Uh, they will not struggle. Yeah, let's get that, that schedule up here. But 
Or well, I think that's the only game to look at. Yeah, let's get the game. schedule up and, and maybe talk about uh, New Mexico State a little bit here, Chad. And I, I know our top ten is coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a team, sort of the chronology here, last year won 29 games. I think they lost at – it was either at Kansas or against Kansas in Kansas City by just two. Uh, you saw what they did against Auburn in the NCAA tournament. They kind of blew the game. Auburn went on to go to the Final Four. Uh, so we were big, big, big on this team this year because they had virtually all their top players back. Year starts, this team is crumpled with suspensions and injuries, or maybe it was just injuries um, and everything else, and they lost some games that you wouldn't – that, that kind of hurt them. But since everybody's been back, they haven't lost. But on a lighter note – question, the, how good is this team? I was going to say on a lighter note in the conference this week, Kansas City got a win against the Chicago State, but was there really a need to throw a parade midweek for that? <laughs> yeah. They were pumped for that one. Uh, you, you look at this New Mexico State team – uh, I don't know that they lose another game. You got to circle that February twenty seventh game at, at Grand Canyon, but uh, I really think that this team may not lose again until the NCAA tournament. Yeah, and, and you, when you look at their resume, Chad, what does it say to you? It probably says thirteen, fourteen seed. I, I, I think should they not lose based again, based on the resumes, based on the resume. Yeah, right, okay, right, right. But if you say, hey, this team is not going to lose again until the NCAA tournament, which means they're going to sweep the rest of those games. You see how the remaining schedule they'll go. 3 and 0 in the conference tournament take the auto bid out of the out of the whack. I think a 13 seed is 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 there. I don't know that they can make that 12 seed line which a few of these auto yeah of, the, of these under the radar teams will make, but I right. think there there are that next group down in the 13 seed absolutely, especially they beat a pretty good Mississippi State team. They beat a, okay. beat a pretty good Colorado State team and they would have gone undefeated against their conference and there's an asterisk by a lot of those losses yeah, that's the thing chad the asterisk by the losses particularly wazoo probably new mexico in a lot I, of I, I think you got to do a double asterisk by the new mexico losses because that was a full strength new mexico team that yeah. they lost to twice and an under strength new mexico state team it's the reverse absolute reverse yeah. right now so so here's the question their resume says 13 seed do you want to play this team, a team that that is probably on the court, even if the resume doesn't back it up, when they're at full strength, a well, top 40 team? David, as a Rutgers alum, whose team has not paid in the NCAA since 1991. Okay, I'll you. play anybody in the first round. But, right. <laughs> but uh, if you're a four seed, no, I do not want to be matched up with New Mexico State. Yeah. Um, on that note, let's go over to our top 10 lists. This is our, uh, the three of us, as well as our colleague Rocco Miller from Bracketeer.org, all voted this week. Rocco couldn't make the show, but we're going to start with some honorable mentions. Teams getting votes that did not make the top 10. We have North Texas, Akron, Winthrop, Bethune Cookman. Oh, making it an honorable mention. All right. right state. And how about those Merrimack Warriors? Somebody oh, here Merrimack. is still voting right, for them. Yeah. Somebody is. The rest of you are not, <laughs> but somebody is. Uh, uh, number 10. We have Vermont uh, out of the American okay, East. Yeah. Very good team there. Uh, at number nine, we've got Liberty still hanging in there despite a couple hiccups in the past uh, couple weeks here. I didn't vote for them, but that's fair. Ooh, at okay. number eight, you got Louisiana Tech, our top team out of Conference USA at this point. At number seven, Furman, one of those three SOCON teams we had a little bit of a discussing a discussion about. They're pretty and good. Greensboro, oh, right Greensboro, above them. still up there. I didn't I, think. Actually, Greensboro, Greensboro above Furman. I think that's a little backwards, but yeah. you guys all voted. And uh, uh, number five, New Mexico State, David. We just discussed them. Yeah, and they are good. Uh, at number four, we've got uh, Stephen F. Austin out of the Southland Conference. Uh, now has a several game lead in the conference on the strength of. Let me see if I can get a final score here. Um, Yes, uh, Sam Houston State, who had been in also tied for second place, they, also they lost, lost tonight to, to, to Incarnate Word. To pathetically bad Incarnate Word, yes. So uh, we're, now looking at, we're now looking at a three-game lead, I believe, in the conference standings for the Lumberjacks. Yeah. Uh, at number three, there's Yale, the Bulldogs. Yeah, this is a good. team that is bored, as we mentioned, could break the top 25 if they keep winning just on the strength of victories and overall record, mm -hmm. nothing else. Number two, East Tennessee State, the top team in the SOCON. Yeah. I and like shouldn't be much of a surprise here. Number one, the best team in the Missouri Valley Conference, Northern Iowa. A very yeah. dangerous team when we get to March. Right. I, I, well, I'll save it for my final thought. 
Well, uh, why don't we move to final thoughts? And John, well, let's start with you, and then we'll go to whatever David was going to say. <laughs> I teased a little bit earlier, but about the same time last year, we had uh, mentioned Mary Mack on one of these podcasts as a team that was actually going to be making their swan song in the D2 NCAA tournament. While they haven't released our regional rankings as far as I've seen, keep an eye on uh, teams like uh, UC San Diego, who is actually number three in the overall D2 poll this week, and uh, Dixie State, who is also going to be making the jump up. They checked in at number 23 right here. So it's going to be a Bell- couple teams to keep an eye on under the radar in March. Yeah, Bellarmine too. Uh, I don't know where they're ranked right now, but they had been number one for a minute. Yeah, amazing that you know, teams can come off from lower levels, compete at the D1 level, be successful, a.k.a. Grand Canyon in their transition, yeah. a.k.a. Mary Mack in their very first year. But the NCAA says you need four years to acclimate yourselves, and you can't play in the postseason until then. And then we've also got the number one overall team in Northwest Missouri State that came within an eyelash of beating Duke in an exhibition game back in October. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but but David, yeah, um, you know, Mary Mack should be allowed to play the NCAA tournament. In my opinion, yeah. Like, I don't know why it's a four-year transition. I, if you're going to have a transition, it's not entirely nonsensical, but four years is a year. Uh, <laughs> let, let me let you get your last final thought in here, David. Um, we've kind of gone back and forth. At the, you know, there was a point early on in the season, uh, November, December, I think it was around December, where I felt like – we had really, really strong under the radar teams and that we might see multiple teams in the rankings and multiple teams inside the bubble. Then all through January, I was thinking we would not see a single one of them in the rankings or inside the bubble. I don't know about the rankings, but I'm starting to feel good about the quality of the teams. I think East Tennessee State and Northern Iowa at least have a path to landing on the bubble, probably inside of it, at least Northern Iowa. East Tennessee State has that bad loss, but on the court, I like New Mexico State. We talked about them. I think East Tennessee State can play well. I think New, Me- you know, um, Northern Iowa can certainly play well. They've proven it. Uh, we might have – I mean, the round of 64 might not be a total joke like I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks ago. Right. If all these teams can, can get there. And, and, and let me make teams. one addition right here before Chad weighs in. Bellerman is actually tied for 13th in the uh, okay, national D2 poll this week. Yeah. Right, but, but what I was going to get to here is, you know, five, about five and a half weeks from now, everybody's going to begin to be filling out their NCAA tournament brackets. A lot of these teams that David just mentioned here, the SOCON champion, be it East Tennessee State or Greensboro or Furman, uh, be it team like New Mexico State and Northern Iowa, these are the teams that you're going to be wanting to pick to, to win those first-round games because these are teams that are – probably just as good, if not better, than the teams that you're going to see on the four, five, six lines in, in, the, in the bracket. But they're going to get these lower seats because they are in these conferences, quite frankly. Yeah, and it's – I mean, we say this every year. When you look at the 12 line and even the 13 line last year, if the 13 line or the 12 line were to play anybody that was inside the bubble but in the bottom half of the bracket, so 9, 10, and 11, I think they'd beat them all. Like yeah, last year, the 12, on, a, on a fair neutral court, games. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if New Mexico State had to go to, uh, you know, had to go to Purdue, they're going to struggle. But yeah, they, they could beat that type of team on, on a neutral court. Well, yeah, they could. They almost well, beat Auburn. Auburn well, maybe, was... maybe not Purdue with what they did tonight, but uh, that, that's, yeah, that's a completely yeah. different story when they, went to, when they crushed Iowa. But uh, yeah. on that note, we have now completely forgotten about under the radar. We've moved back above the radar. But uh, I do want to thank everybody for joining us. We'll be back in tomorrow night with our, one of our bracket rundown shows and lots of stuff on the website. But on behalf of David Griggs, John Salika, I'm Chad Sherwood. Thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you again real soon.